Well, warm greetings to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us for worship here at the First Unitarian Church in Salt Lake City. And today, we are very fortunate. We have a wonderful guest with us, Nicole Pinnell, who is going to be our cellist. And she is absolutely fantastic. Many of you may remember her from prior performances here at the church. Uh, she has performed not only in this church, but also, oh, what's the, the other place? Carnegie Hall, that's right. She's also performed at Carnegie Hall. She has been a soloist on too many, too many albums to mention. They've all been uh, nominated for Grammys. She's also been tutored quite well. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma is one of her teachers. She loves jazz and improv, and she composes Nicole Thank you so much for being with us today. I have a number of announcements to make, uh, which may be an indication that we are moving steadfastly along towards Christmas. And so please bear with me. There are, uh, oh, three or four announcements. The first one is really all about you. The first announcement pertains to your extraordinary generosity. You may recall just recently, uh, this was for Thanksgiving, we wanted to uh, again support our sister church, San Esteban, over in West Valley. And this congregation came through with upwards of $7,500 to help that congregation. And when I spoke to their minister, the Reverend Dr. Pablo Ramos, I, I thought I needed to extend a Kleenex to him through the telephone wires or something. It, it, was, it was so overwhelming. And, and he said, Tom, please thank the congregation from the bottom of all of our hearts. We are happy for that congregation and very pleased that we can help out to the extent that we did. I hope that we can somehow sustain this generosity uh, a little while longer. Uh, our, our tremendous religious education program department is working to uh, get canned foods over to the food bank, and I want you to please check your newsletter for details. I can tell you now that there is a bin in front of the church, the main doors, north-facing doors, to collect the items, and we'll make sure we bring them in every day. Uh, and so let us continue our generosity with uh, this food drive for the food bank, the Utah Food Bank. Next, I want to mention that Vicki, Uretzi, and Bella have been in sanctuary in this church for nearly three years. And in that time, obviously, because of who they are and who all of you are, very warm and wonderful relationships have formed. And as we get towards Christmas, I know that the instinct is to go out and buy those wonderful children as many toys as we can. And if you multiply that by, oh, I don't know, two or three hundred members of the church, we have no place to put that. So I'm going to say, and it's a very strange thing to say, please do not give them any toys this year. There are needs to be sure. And the best way that we can tackle those needs is to give as generously as we can to the Sanctuary Family Fund. You can find that on our website, the Donate button. There's a special uh, listing there for the Sanctuary Family Fund. And uh, you can also send a check to the church, uh, give a fly, give a give look fly, whatever. Choose, choose your own method of uh, sending uh, some support for, for Vicki and her girls. And the last, the last announcement, I want to say that on Monday, December 7th, which is this coming Monday, our endowment committee, a very vital, important, and wonderful part of this church, wants to invite as many of you as possible to zoom in 
Monday night the 7th at 7 o'clock to hear a, a special presentation about how the tax changes are going to affect giving uh, to, um, um, to organizations, giving to nonprofit organizations, especially our church. It's going to be a lot of very useful information, information that's changing all the time. And please tune in and look at your newsletter to get the, uh, um, the, the right uh, access, the right click for, uh, for the Zoom. And uh, you're going you're gonna to be astounded by uh, the wealth of information that's there to help you and will also help the church. So zoom in on Monday night the 7th. I think that about wraps up our announcements. And we're about now ready to, to light the chalice. I know many of you have a chalice at home. Some of you use candles. Um, so this might be the time we want to just whew, exhale, which is a good exercise, especially before the holidays. So let's just take a deep breath or two and really feel united in our congregation. We may not all be visible to each other, but there's this very special connection that arises when we do a ritual together, such as lighting the chalice. Symbol of light and of knowledge. Symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. Today's Time for All Ages is a story titled Russell, 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 written by Kristen Mayer. Summer was just beginning. While most children were running wild with the heat and fun and freedom of summer, Michael dreaded it already. Living so far from town, Michael knew he would hardly see another kid until the fall. His parents played with him in the evening, but the days themselves stretched long and lonely. That morning, after he finished his chores, his mother told him to go, go, go out and play. Michael went out, but what could he play all alone? He slowly wandered down to the river and sat on a fallen log. A tear formed in his eye. He wiped it away quickly, imagining what the boys at school would say. Instead, he just sat, not playing, not thinking, not feeling anything. Then, out of the corner of his eye, he saw a movement. Russell, Russell, Russell. Michael froze. Russell, Russell, Russell. A tiny mouse-like creature was poking around the leaves. It was a shrew. Then he heard it. Eep, beep, beep, eep, beep, beep. The shrew turned and locked eyes with him. Weep, 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 weep. As if upon command, the tears welled up in Michael's eyes. A wet river of loneliness rolled down his cheeks. He hung his head and cried. When he finally looked up, the shrew was gone. Each day after that, when his mother told him to go, go, go out and play, Michael went straight down to the river. If he sat quietly and still, eventually he would hear, Russell, 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 Russell. The little creature never stayed long. A sudden movement or the shadow of a crane flying overhead would send it scurrying. Still, every day that Michael went down to the river, he saw the shrew. That is, until one day. Michael waited and waited and waited, but the shrew never appeared. At supper that night, Michael sat silently, pushing his peas around and around his plate. Something wrong, son? His father asked. 
Michael set down his fork. I've been watching the shrew down by the river. I've seen him every day, but today he never came. Mm, I saw cranes across the river again, said his mother. Probably one of them got it. Michael froze. Oh, Michael, honey, said his mother. I know it seems cruel to us, but it's just nature's way. Michael didn't say a word. Son, said his father gently, we can only have the beauty of cranes because they feed from nature. All Michael could say was, I don't think they're very beautiful. The next day, Michael slowly wandered down to the river. He sat on that same log, not playing, not thinking, not feeling anything. Then, out of the corner of his eye, he saw movement. Michael turned, but there was no shrew. It was a large gray bird, a crane. Michael felt the heat of anger rise in his chest, but before he could do anything, the crane turned and locked eyes with him. Coo-roo-roo-roo, it cried. Coo-roo-roo-roo. Cry, cry, cry. As if on pawn command, the tears welled up in Michael's eyes once again. A wet river of loneliness rolled down his cheeks. He hung his head and cried. When he finally looked up, the crane was still there. They stared at one another a long time, boy and bird, the spell broken only by the coo of another crane across the river. The bird looked at Michael a moment longer before turning, stretching its wings, pushing off and pulling itself into the air. Michael watched it glide over the river, land and walk awkwardly toward its mate. Watching those birds together, Michael knew they were beautiful Then, as if for the first time, he noticed everything around him. He heard the water rushing. He saw the river reeds waving. He heard the frogs and the birds and the bugs all around him. And he knew he was not alone. Life was everywhere. Then, a ways off, he heard, rustle, 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 rustle. is the loneliest person in the whole world. It's hard to say, but in 2019, Australian explorer Jeff Wilson was definitely in the running. In November of that year, he left his home on the Gold Coast of Australia and headed for Antarctica, determined to become the world record holder for the longest ever unsupported solo expedition across the southern continent. His journey would take him from Thor's hammer on the Atlantic coast to the Pole of Inaccessibility, then on to Dome Argus, 
the highest point on the Antarctic Plateau and the coldest place on Earth, before returning him to Thor's hammer, a journey of over 5,000 kilometers on foot and on skis. It took 23 days for Jeff to reach the pole of inaccessibility. Once there, he became the most isolated human being on Earth. At that moment, Jeff was closer to the astronauts on the International Space Station, orbiting 400 kilometers above the surface, than he was to any other human being. Polar expeditions have long been among the most romantic of human achievements and were as daring to humans of the 19th century as moon missions were to those of the 20th. But they are feats of ambition only for those who are willing to suffer the most brutal conditions, with wind chills that can drop to 100 degrees below zero, cracks and crevasses in the ice that can appear suddenly and drop hundreds of feet, and almost no natural features for use in navigation. Danger lurks at every step. Few adventurers have even attempted exploration of the Antarctic continent. Many of those who have attempted have died. Perhaps the most underappreciated danger of the journey, however, is the extreme isolation. Miles and miles of empty snowscapes and no sound other than the wild, cold wind in your ears bring the unparalleled solitude into sharp relief. Wilson spent 58 days on the ice, seeing no other living being during that time. As he approached the pole of inaccessibility, he began to see what looked like an illusion. You look at your GPS and it says it's two kilometers out, he says, and you start to doubt your navigation. And then suddenly you start to see what looks like a man. And then you realize he's not moving and it's Lenin with no arms. <laughs> the bust of Vladimir Lenin planted there by Soviet scientists in 1959. Wilson goes on, but he's life-size and your eyes are so desperate to see something human that it's convincing you that there's a human there and you're excited to see someone. Then you get in and realize that it's this bronze bust of Lenin in the most bleak, isolated part of the planet. Imagine what a lonesome feeling it must be to be so far from other humans to be farther away from society than any other human with only Vladimir Lenin for company. And yet, though explorers like Wilson do suffer from the loneliness, they also report feelings of almost supernatural connection with the universe, even connection with humanity, just like the astronauts peering out the rocket windows that pale blue glowing planet where everyone they've ever known and loved has lived out their whole beautiful life. Something about being all alone, truly alone, makes us crave that connection. That kind of spiritual solitude hooks them and has them back out in the wild alone again and again. Perhaps you are all alone in your little spaceship, in your building or on your street. Or perhaps you and your loved ones are alone together. Perhaps it would help to think of yourself as an explorer on an expedition to an undiscovered country. When we all return once again to civilization, what stories we will have to share. What alien la landscapes will we tell about? What inner universes? What treasures excavated, which only solitude can reveal? 
My wish for you is that your times of solitude be not a burden, but a blessing. May your explorations be guided by wisdom. May you come home safely to us and we to you. Amen. As I wind my way towards the completion of 46 years of ministry, I realize that of the wide range of sermon topics that I have covered through the many decades, sometimes revisiting a topic once or twice, if it is so merited, I have never addressed the subject of loneliness. I wonder why that is. I've certainly been keenly aware of loneliness as a grave concern among members of all the congregations that I have served, especially coming to the fore around the holidays. It's at that loaded time of year when the, the ache of being alone is felt most acutely. Rather than offer a sermon on the subject, which in all honesty, I felt that it was well probably too public for, for such a fragile experience, I doubled down instead on, on pastoral visits to those whom I felt were lonely and could use a little cheerful company. But you know, in retrospect, I think, it was my own discomfort about loneliness that precluded me from ever delivering a sermon on the topic. I have known loneliness personally, but thought of it mostly as a, as a measure of my own failings. Somehow, I believed it reflected poorly upon me of you know, who, who I was as a person. My teenage years, and I suspect this is true for most of us, 
Those teenage years were marked by a dread of not being included by my peers. <laughs> you know, loneliness was even worse than acne, if you know what I mean. The thought of staying home alone on a Saturday night was pure torture. The, the embarrassment alone would wreak havoc on my self-esteem. But early on in college, in a large lecture hall for a class in psychology and social relations, I'll never forget it, the professor stunned the entire class by asking, raise your hand if, if you feel you have enough friends. Go, go, just, just raise your hand. Do you have enough friends? Yeah, just raise your hand. Whoa. Well, ooh, a tremendous uneasiness spread through the classroom and students started looking sideways and, and kind of up because one of those amphitheater kind of lecture halls um, or depending on where you were seated, they may look down. Was, was anybody raising their hands? You know, we all pretended to be so popular outside the confines of school, living a fun-filled social life with an abundance of wild friends and outrageous parties. Oh, it was great. I'm Mr. Popular. Not one student raised a hand. Now, some giggles could be heard, but really just a, a meager cover-up for the possible embarrassment of confirming so publicly that loneliness was possible to some extent. Now, the point of the exercise was moving the experience of loneliness into a context that spoke to the human condition. Make sure there's, I mean, we need to make sure there's no mistake about it and that we all know loneliness. And we will do practically anything to avoid it. Loneliness is so terrifying that people, people will be secretive about it. It's as if some humiliation were attached to it. The science of loneliness concludes pretty much that the longing for deep ties of human connection stays with every human being from infancy, which we can all understand, throughout all of one's life. This is, this is how we are wired. But it gets tricky. Lots of us, including me, like to be alone. Solitude is different from loneliness. Loneliness, I hate. Periods of seclusion are sought after. Now, we, we love the moniker of rugged individualism, to which some of us aspire up to a point. You know, one of the greatest neuroscientist researchers into the subject of loneliness, Dr. John Cacioppo, who died just two years ago, and in fact, his nickname was Dr. Loneliness. Well, anyway, he, he explored the, the evolutionary theories of loneliness that go back 52 million years to the very first primates. All primates need to belong to an intimate social group in order to survive. It could be a family, it could be a roving band, it could be a tribe, you know, I mean, even, even a gang, if need be, just, just to feel that you belong, You've got this connection. Well, there's little wonder then why loneliness becomes so problematical, especially during the holidays. The holidays focus on family and friends. 
It's a time when close ties to others are affirmed. If by whatever set of circumstances you feel disconnected from this basic group, this basic source of affection, loneliness becomes accentuated. Now, loneliness, in clinical terms, is regarded as a state of profound distress. When human beings do not feel bonded to other people through these ties of affection, they then endure the anguish experienced by all unattached primates since the beginning of time. There's nothing, there's nothing novel about loneliness. The COVID pandemic underscores loneliness by imposing, just think about it, lockdowns, sheltering in place, quarantines, isolation. Just, just this past Thanksgiving, where many of us followed health rules by severely limiting contact with anyone outside the immediate household, we received something like a snapshot of loneliness. You know, our, our family and friends may, may be there somewhere in theory, but the physical isolation still packed a wallop and it certainly just smacks of loneliness. I have, I have been in touch over the past several months with many in our congregation who live in care facilities. Now there you'll find a time of, of great struggle. If, for example, you need to leave the facility, let's say, just to go to the dentist, when you return, you are quarantined for 14 days. You don't see anyone. Food is just brought to your room. And when someone in the care facility is infected with COVID, be it uh, a staff person or just a, another resident, my God, there's a complete lockdown for 14 days by yourself. No socializing in the dining room, no drop-in visitors from neighbors. It's, it's very, very lonely. Now, most, if not all, of our members in care facilities are widows or widowers. At some time in their lives, they suddenly were forced to face the world without a spouse. Grief and loneliness are inextricably linked to each other. The ties of affection have been severed, and as primates now, as primates, like the primates going back 52 million years, we must belong to an intimate social group in order to survive. Now, to be sure, marriage is not an automatic buffer against loneliness. I'm using marriage here really as, as shorthand for being connected in a particularly meaningful relationship for quite some time. In fact, to be honest, you know, the latest polls indicate that anywhere between one third and one half of all married people feel loneliness. Let's understand that a devastating loneliness occupies the soul whenever a deep love relationship ends. What I can say unequivocally is that there's no human being who isn't threatened by the loss of interpersonal intimacy. Now this, this remains true for all primates. The historian Jill Lepore recounts recounts the story contained in the annals of a Philadelphia zoo from seven, excuse me, 1874 
captured in records set down by the zoo's superintendent, Arthur Brown. Here's what happened. The zoo, in Philadelphia, by the way, was the first zoo in our country. The zoo acquired a male and female chimpanzee from West Africa. These chimpanzees in the wild, you know, they live in groups of six or eight, and they kind of build these platforms and they just always hang together. But here's just the two of them now. Two of them are captured, brought back to Philadelphia in the monkey house now. Just the two of them, sleeping at night in each other's arms on a blanket which was laid down on the floor. The female chimpanzee died of complications from a cold early in the morning, December 1878. And when she died, human observers noted the behavior of the surviving male chimpanzee. He tried in vain to rouse her. And then, then he went into a frenzy of grief. It was Charles Dickens, by the way, who in fact described the human response to loss as seeking relief by violent and almost frantic movements. Let's remember, people are primates. The bereaved chimpanzee began to pull out the hair from his head. He wailed, making sounds the zookeeper never heard before. It was recorded as something like this. Ha, ah, 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 ah. His cries were heard over the, the entire zoological garden. He dashed himself against the bars of the cage and butted his head upon the hard wood floor. And when this burst of grief was ended, he poked his head under the straw in one corner and moaned as though his heart would break. These were the exact words used by the zookeeper. And when I think of this, this primate confronting his loneliness for the first time, I hear this, this universal sound of crying despair, which perhaps is best captured by a cello. So we hear the sound of the bonds of affection completely and utterly shattered. You know, Jill Lepore frames loneliness as a grief distended. What an image. Loneliness is a grief distended. And we know what she means. It is in our grief 
that we, well, we weep for ourselves. Why? Because we meet loneliness head on, suddenly bereft of this primal need to belong in relationship. Loneliness, as well as we have all experienced, visits us whenever we feel socially isolated. Loneliness, of course, is not, is not limited to the death of a loved one. It was way beyond that. I mean, social scientists claim now that loneliness is a sad reality of modern times. They point out that more people are living alone and aging alone than ever before. We are increasingly disconnected socially. Our, our groups, you know, the groups that, that once provided support and company and made us feel less that, well, you know, we're, we're really all on our own, these, these groups now are falling apart. And I'm talking about labor unions, civic associations, neighborhood organizations, religious groups, bowling leagues, multi-generational multi households being replaced by just a nuclear family. Now, all these groups once provided a stronger sense of solidarity than they do now. What is the one word we hear again and again for why people join our church? We know the word, community. People are primates. We need connections leading to relationships. We need to belong. You know, we may, we may still cherish periods of aloneness, but mostly, we get the strength to be alone when we also feel connected. In the, in the Beatles song, Eleanor Rigby, the question is raised, all the lonely people, where do they all come from? And the question is being explored seriously in these modern times where regardless how many friends you can count on social media, the archetypical need for bonds of intimate connections go unfulfilled. And public health experts from many different countries are debating how to address what they term a loneliness epidemic. We are now facing a loneliness epidemic that corrodes modern life, and also has very serious health consequences. Great Britain has taken a lead on this, where two years ago they, they actually appointed a, a government minister for loneliness. Can you imagine that? A minister for loneliness. And this, this minister for loneliness contends that we are all touched by loneliness at some point, but as well intended as this new cabinet position may be, I don't think that the minister nor the government itself have a real handle on the complexity of loneliness. Thus far, they are handing out small grants to local garden clubs, bird watching groups, and others so they can invite more people to join. One grant, the equivalent of $640, went to a Birmingham group to buy board games in order to start a game club. England has established what they call friendly benches, where people are encouraged to go and chat with one another. There's also a dog walking club, which in my experience really doesn't need any organization. The soaring suicide rates in our country can be largely attributed to loneliness. 
But this is not new stuff. My goodness, Shakespeare made one of the earliest references to loneliness in the English language. In Hamlet, Ophelia commits suicide because of her loneliness. And Shakespeare identifies that. You know, her father was killed. Hamlet really doesn't care for her. On and on, you know, the groups with which she had bonded are now completely dissolved, and she feels abject pain in her loneliness. How, how pervasive is loneliness? Well, Barack Obama's Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, said that, well, he trained in internal medicine to work on heart disease, cancer, diabetes. He said he never expected to encounter so many people struggling with loneliness. And he adds, you know, it, it can cut your life short. Loneliness does not lend itself to an easy fix. Now, this sermon would sound like an advice column if I try to dish out how you're going to just cure feelings of loneliness. Now, if I said, you know, go join a dog walkers club, I'm, you know, it's nonsense. Loneliness, although clearly rooted in the human condition, when you examine it, you find out it's, it's really quite amorphous. I mean, how, how do you even go about measuring it? But it is important to know that loneliness is not unique to you. And perhaps it could even serve you in a, in a positive way as a signal if you're starting to have a couple of bouts of loneliness. Well, maybe, maybe it's time that you become aware of this and this will kind of motivate you to be a little bit more deliberate about your own social outreach. And for those of us who are blessed temporarily with social connections, well, you know, we may want to be a bit more conscious of those whom we know to be alone during the holidays, during a quarantine, during this pandemic. It's nice to send a card, but you know, you gotta ask, is that really sufficient? Call them, it's that, it's that human contact, that human connection, call them, and conceivably even you know, once this pandemic is over, invite them, invite them to your home. You know, we have, we've all been there. This loneliness stuff is not uh, just for a couple of of people who've been singled out. We've all been there. Is, isn't, that, isn't that amazing when you think about it? We have all been gripped by loneliness and we all fear it. Or maybe not. Uh, go, raise, raise your hand if you have enough friends. Go ahead, go ahead. Ra raise your hands if you have enough friends.